Hello, I'm Yolanda Dalva and welcome to Do You See What I See? Today we have an extraordinary woman pioneer in broadcasting, Maria Elena Salinas. She has uh, been an anchor on Univision for three decades, I believe. We don't wanna go too longer than that. And uh, she is uh, also a founder of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and a philanthropist. She's also in the uh, Hispanic Journalist Hall of Fame. She's had such a spectacular career and I would really recommend you take a look at her Wikipedia bio because there's much too much to include here. But I promise you, if you want to go into a career in broadcast or if you want to have a fabulous uh, role model, intelligent woman that can help guide your life, uh, you'll want to know more about Maria Elena Salinas. So welcome to Do You See What I See, Maria Elena. Thank you, Yolanda. It's so such a joy to to hear your voice, to see you. It's been many, many years and talking about, you know, people who, who are pioneers, you are definitely a pioneer for all of us uh, Latinas that are in the news media. Well, we, we both started in LA, you on Spanish TV with KMEX and I started with KMBC uh, in English and uh, we got to know each other then. And then, you know, you went off to, uh, you worked in Los Angeles and then you went off to uh, Univision Network in Miami, Florida uh, where you spent several decades and your career just keeps escalating and escalating. And we'll talk about that during the, you know, the question and answer, the question period. But I'm just stunned by what I read, uh, by all of your contributions, by the variety of things that you've done. Uh, and so I want to start though with your background. And I know that you had uh, an upbringing in Mexico. You had, you did your first years of schooling there and then you came to this country. And I remember when I reread your uh, contribution in It's All in the Frijoles, the Book of Latino Virtues, that I was very struck by the way that your parents gave you wisdom. I want you to tell us how that wisdom that you learned from your parents and your family uh, has guided your life and helped you in your career. Well, I, I was actually born in Los Angeles. And when I was just one year old, we went to live in Mexico and came back when I, when I was seven, almost eight years old. So um, I grew up, you know, bilingual, bicultural. I spent the rest of that time in Los Angeles until I moved to Miami for, for, for work reasons. But, you know, we're always searching and looking for role models and we're trying to see who are the people that we learn from. And sometimes we don't stop to think that it really is since your childhood that you begin to gain some of that knowledge that helps you and that defines you. And, and I think that when I stopped to, to take a look at that, I realized that everything that I needed to know to turn me into who I am came from my parents. And, it, you know, I, I guess from um, sometimes when, when uh, people come to this country as immigrants, like my parents came here from immigrants, their struggle is such that you learn from them. And I think that's one of the superpowers that we have as Latinas, that we have witnessed our parents struggle. And both my mother and my father were very wise. I mean, my father was a brilliant man, uh, but he was a very humble man. And my mother was also a very humble woman and very kind. And she worked all her life as a seamstress and he worked different jobs. And you know, I don't wanna get into it too much, but you know, I found out later on in, in life that my father, after he passed away, that he had been a priest, which helped me to understand why he was never successful in business. And he just dedicated <laughs> himself to, to helping people. But you know, I, I think there were some basic things, some some lines. You know, you hear things and you and and you don't realize that they get stored in the back of your brain. And, and I remember, um, you know, learning from my parents is, you know, don't be a conformist and don't allow yourself to be mediocre. And you never stop learning. And if there's if you can make a difference in people's lives, do. Those are just some of the phrases that I remember from them that really helped guide, you know, who I am as a person and and as a professional. I was able to use that that learning, that, that knowledge uh, in my profession. I think I applied it every step of the way and I continue to do that. Well, it's a good foundation and, and our mothers were both in the garment industry and it's interesting how, how you do learn so much. And I also love clothes, you know, and good goods because she worked for a very fine uh, manufacturer, Helga Oppenheimer. But what then took you when you got to Miami that's a totally different environment, totally different change. Of course, you know, heavily uh, Cuban uh, uh, Hispanic group. And, and so what led you and guided you in terms of, of uh, your 
your choices of stories? Did you get to suggest those? Because you've interviewed presidents, uh, President Clinton and Obama. You've uh, interviewed uh, uh, dictators in Latin America. And one of the people I was fascinated by then and continue to be and would like to get your take on him is uh, Subcomandante Marcos, uh, who was a Zapatista and, and had many good ideas and ideals for the indigenous people of Chiapas. How did you experience him? Well, in, in reality, my, my move from the local to the network started when I was still in Los Angeles because for a few years, the network newscast moved from Miami to Los Angeles and then we were in, in, in Orange County in Laguna Niguel. And I think that move from the local to the network was really you know, one of the biggest changes and biggest challenges of my career because I felt really that I knew my community well in Los Angeles. I had been there six years. I really felt connected with my community. And all of a sudden I was gonna have, I was gonna have a completely different audience. They weren't just the Mexican Americans from Los Angeles. They were, they were from all over the, the, the you know, Latin America and, and, and you know, with different idiosyncrasies. So really early on, I began to, uh, you know, realize the diversity within the community that everyone talks about so much. Uh, I, I learned that since the beginning in idiosyncrasies and language and, and customs and culture and their music and their food and everything. And so, you know, I, I traveled a lot. Also, I traveled to Latin America a lot. I did a lot of preparation to try to understand each one of those communities and where they were coming from, because you have to meet them where they are and you have to understand what brought them to this country and the conditions that they lived in in their own country and their experiences in order to be able to cover it. And I covered everything from politics to natural disasters to armed conflicts, and of course, our community here. And it's funny that you should mention Subcomandante Marcos because that's probably one of my most memorable interviews. It's one of the ones that I've enjoyed the most. And it, you know, after I did cover the resurrection into, um, I'm, I mean, the, the revolution or whatever you want to call it during, I think it was 2000. No, it was before that. Yeah. It was 19. 97, I think is, 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 um, I think that was it. Yeah. yeah. I think it was in early 1997. What and I struck you most. I covered it first. And then in 2000 was the first time that he was going to come from Chiapas into Mexico city after, after Vicente Fox, uh, won. So we did everything possible to be able to get an interview with him, uh, while he was in Mexico city. I mean, it was a long process, but finally we got the interview. I was able to sit down with him. Um, for an hour interview. And after that, in, after I finished, he said, I'm sorry, I made you wait so long. You can continue asking me whatever you want. And as you know, sometimes when you get past the scheduled and questions that you have, you know, so meticulously prepared and you just begin to have a conversation, some of the best things come out. And, and I think that's what happened with Subcomandante Marcos when we started talking about his life in the jungle and and how did he get all those communicates if he's in the jungle, didn't he have electricity? Where did they sleep? You know, who was his partner? What, what did they eat? How did they live? And, and that was very, very, very interesting. Well, um, he was a philosopher and a literature professor before all, uh, he became a, an advocate, a social justice uh, advocate. That's what they say. He's never admitted to being the person that they say that he is. Okay, all right. He used to stay behind his mask. He wouldn't take off his mask, of course, when, when he was with us. But one thing that was interesting is that after the interview, when we were walking around just to get some video, to get some B-roll, he told my cameraman, let me let me carry your camera so I can remember my years as a journalist. So <laughs> everyone standing there, he was a journalist. Well, he was once a journalist. Let's try to find out, you know, if that's part of this professor's background to see if it's really that person. You know, he's always been an enigma. And uh, up to this day, we don't really know we haven't been able to confirm who he is and what he's doing right now. But you know, one of the things he was able to accomplish with the Zapatista movement was uh, for the women. The women of the Zapatista movement, I think had the most to gain uh, from, from that revolution because they were treated as second class citizens. Now they had more power. They had more power within the structure of the, of the Zapatista movement, but also were able to get, gain some rights because in the indigenous areas of Mexico City, you know, I mean, of, of, of the country of Mexico, you know, women's rights are stampled on, really, they have no rights. I, I, I remember he, reading once that it was um, worse to kill a cow or steal a cow than to hit a woman or kill a woman. So now a lot of new laws 
against feminicide in, in all of Latin America. But before, you know, it was like, you can't take my cows, when, but if you hit my woman or you kill my woman, it's not, it's not uh, as bad as stealing a cow. I mean, that's ridiculous. They need to be treated with respect. And I think that they were able to gain some ground during that revolution. So something came out of it that was positive. Well, I think we have to have some kind of feminist revolution here to counter what's going on now with the U.S. Supreme Court. We're, we're really mired in, in a number of problems and issues here in this country. But I was always intrigued by him. So I, I, I thank you for that because I, it is fascinating. You know, how, do you, how do you develop those skills and, and survival out in, uh, in the jungle and, and communications and all the rest of it? Yeah, and he wanted to be employed, so at least create a forum for them because nobody was paying attention. And, and, and it also helped some of the other indigenous communities uh, across Latin America. So he figured if we make some noise and we use some, you know, and, and we use our weapons and, and we call attention to this, and this is one way, and he that could do it and could help them organize. Um, you know, he was able to accomplish a lot. So, you know, he's admirable, even though some people say, oh, he's just a rebel. He's just a dirty rebel who doesn't take a bath in the, in, in, in the mountains. But no, he made a difference and, and he had an impact uh, for so many people that were forgotten and ignored. Yes, yes, and that's that's important. There's there's one thing that this, this leads me to something else. We really have a very mixed uh, uh, attitude and, and diplomacy and, and policy in Latin America. And we don't really seem to understand that their history is very similar to our own. They got the same ideas from France and the, you know, the French Revolution and, and uh, democracy and all of the rest of it and uh, through Simone Bolivar. And, and so a lot of these social, I call them social justice movements uh, that have taken place there have been misnomered and you know, they accuse you of being a communist because then it's, you're, it's all bad. And so you portray the person in a very negative light. We've, done, we've seen that happening here in recent years. Uh, the, uh, it, it's fascinating. I mean, when we look back at that, I really think we need to make some changes in our foreign policy because we don't seem to understand uh, the differences and nuances, the similarities, the common virtues that uh, people in, in Mexico and Latin America bring to this country uh, that we used to have and we used to promote and talk about a more perfect union. Yeah, um, except, well, you know, Latin America has a, 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 a long history of, of uh, abuse, but of survival also, because they were invaded so many times. There were so many efforts to, to just eliminate them completely to the, yeah. the indigenous culture. And, and sometimes when I hear people say that it, you know, south of the border, there is a lesser culture. No, it's a strong culture. It's a, it's a culture of survival. How do they think that they built everything that they built, um, you know, way back, way, way back then? And, and the United States, unfortunately, also has a really bad history in Latin America. They, they created some of the situations that now have people, you know, desperate to leave their countries in search of a better life. You know, they, they supported so many tyrants there. They educated in the School of the Americas so many of the dictators, um, the ruthless dictators that, you know, that, that really, you know, were controlling uh, some of these Latin American countries and oppressing uh, so many of, their, of, of, the, of the communities there. So I, I do think that we, we do bear our responsibility and, and it really pains me when I hear uh, people rejecting Latin Americans the way that they do and not knowing enough about the history to, uh, to realize that we created a lot of the problems that they have back there and that we should be more welcoming and more understanding and more empathetic. Well, I remember a few years ago, I was just speaking at a Hispanic, uh, uh, National Hispanic uh, History Month at the local college here, College of the Desert, where I am now. And the uh, one of the students, I gave a very honest uh, talk about its all the holdings. We were revisiting that book. And I gave a very honest talk about some of my own experiences as a child. And uh, the, the uh, one of the women in the audience uh, was half Mexican. And she said, I feel shame, you know, for being Mexican because there's so much negativity there has been over the decades that's gotten worse since 2015. But uh, I said to her, you have everything to be proud of because it was, it is a great civilization, one of the seven greatest in the world and the pyramids and everything that happened in the culture and the language and the virtues and, and the spirituality, the tremendous spirituality uh, is very powerful. 
And, and it, it's interesting because we don't hear enough of that, Maria Elena. And in Spanish, I'm wondering, Spanish television, are, are those same attitudes that are carried you know, out in, in English television also uh, prevalent in the Spanish television uh, business? No, I think, you know, um, news is news. There's one thing that I've learned now that I've worked both in Spanish and in English is news is news. But the focus sometimes is different. I mean, in Spanish language media, we certainly cover anything and everything that affects the Latino community. We cover Latin America quite a bit. I mean, in, in, in mainstream media, they rarely cover Latin America unless yeah. one American that died in Latin America, you know? It doesn't matter that, you know, 500 uh, Latin Americans died in, in, in an incident. It, 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 only if, if they feel that it affects the, the U.S. And I think that's that has to some extent led to this very, you know, ignorance that there is in this in this country um, about who our neighbors to to the south are. They don't understand our culture. They don't know what they're going through. And you know, way back then when we started, when you and I started in, in the news, the networks were covering Latin America quite a bit. ABC, CBS, and NBC had bureaus. Um, that sometimes were based in Miami, sometimes based in Latin America, where they covered Latin America. But as soon as the Cold War ended, then they closed on those bureaus and never looked south. Now we just, you know, look at Europe, Africa, the rest of the world, but very rarely do we look south, unless it's something very negative when it comes to the drug war um, and when it comes to immigration. And that's usually in a very negative light. So yeah, it's difficult. But, you know, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be a contributor uh, with ABC now, before with CBS, because I, I, I wanted to be able to do some stories about Latinos that were not just immigration, because when they do stories on Latinos, it's usually immigration border and the problems at the border. And in, 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 especially in the last you know few years since Trump was in office in a very negative light. Mm -hmm. And with uh, one of the, my, what I am very proud of working with ABC is that not only am I a contributor, but I'm also a consultant with the race and culture unit. And that allows me the possibility of maybe suggesting stories or suggesting angles. And they've asked me to be, um, to, to, to be a contributing, um, a, a consulting producer in some of the coverage that they do. And, you know, they, they listen to me and I'm very proud of that. I think, you know, people are beginning to open up their eyes and, and try to understand that you know we're americans too and that's what i want to do i mean the other day a young journalist asked me why do you still do this i mean why don't you retire i'm hoping that she might retire. and and i said well you know i i'm not doing this because i'm trying to rebuild a career i already had a career i'm very proud of the career that i had uh i closed that cycle when i felt it was necessary to close it and i think it was the right time to close it but if there's one thing that i've always had in my mind is that we have to change hearts and minds. We have to you know, show this country that we are very much a part of it, a very important part of it, a vital part of this society, and that we have such deep roots here and we shouldn't be treated as we're foreigners in our own country. I mean, the majority of us are US born, the majority of us are American, and yet we're still treated as foreigners. It doesn't matter that you're a citizen. If you look Hispanic, then they treat you as a foreigner. It doesn't matter that you speak English. If you have any kind of an accent, then you know your English isn't good enough. Um, so that's part of my my mission now uh, as a contributor with with ABC News, and and I'm happy to see that more and more news outlets are hiring Latinos, and I'm hoping that the next step will be to allow some of those Latinos to cover the types of stories that they know best because they know their communities. Well, it's important to do that. I think there's a, a great misunderstanding. You know, we always are viewed as the great unwashed, you know, the problem, we're the problem uh, population. And, and it's true that, you know, the majority are. And I was very pleased that you made that point when, uh, when you have done, you know, some of your interviews and the, uh, when you had, you know, analysis, uh, an, 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 analysis of political uh, political uh, issues and events that we have this diversity in the culture. And I don't think a lot of people realize that we're a two, $2.7 trillion market about uh, we're ready to uh, surpass the economy of France, a, culture, a nation. And people don't realize that we're contributing people and it drives me a little bonkers, you know, and I'm not in the news right now, but it does drive me bonkers when I, I see these things and, and so much misunderstanding. So I'm with you. It's very important to open people's eyes so that they can see and understand and begin to appreciate 
the great contributions we've made. I mean, from, you know, going through COVID, good heavens, these people that have been the first responders bringing the food to the table. And I love the work of Jose Andres, you know, that, that started up a uh, food distribution program while well, in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. And then during COVID just came in and has been feeding people right and left. That's an amazing service. Exactly. I think during, during, during COVID, there were thousands of dreamers, for, for example, that were first responders, whether they were in the medical field, you know, so many Im undocumented immigrants that were working to feed the country, to keep this country going. If it had not been for the immigrants, whether they were undocumented or not, this, you know, this country would not have been able to survive, you know, whether food distribution, just the types of services that were needed, they do the types of jobs that can't be done from home, from the comfort of your home on a computer. And they were risking their lives while, while doing that. You know, when I was at CBS, I was very, you know, happy that we were able to do a show called Pandemia. They actually used the word in Spanish, and it was all of the correspondents and producers and, and, and bookers and, and and, and editors, they were all Latino uh, from Latino staff, and we were able to do a half hour special that ended up earning some awards uh, on how Latinos were affected by, by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, little by little, it was just half an hour, but little by little, we are, we're, we're getting there, we're telling our stories, we're getting our stories out there. And that's a, a goal of mine. It is a goal that's a very important one. I'm so proud of you because I saw you on uh, Maria Shriver's Women's Conference in March, and I was just thrilled that you were there because we usually don't have representation there on different programs like that. And of course, she's very intelligent and beautiful and understands the Latino community because she's from Cal, you know, she's lived in California and was the wife of the governor. But the, the, uh, the points that you were making there were very, very important, you know, about the, the diversity, about the contributions, about uh, just having you there was really wonderful, Maria Elena. It was just, I was, I felt so good about that because uh, that's an important uh, outreach that she made there and she had some outstanding people and you were one of them. I think you were one of the best. Thank you, Yolanda. I really appreciate that. Thanks for, thanks for listening in and, and, and watching that. Um, yeah, it was special. Maria Shriver is very special. And in that, that particular session, we were talking about the Latino community and the African-American community and, and you know, how we're affected. And also that was uh, one of the topics there was also aging, right? Yeah. And uh, embracing aging. And, um, and she did talk to, to us about that also. I well, remember- a powerful event, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's great. And she's always been great. I remember since she used to have these amazing conferences annually, annually uh, when she was uh, the first lady of California. And I wish she would have continued them because this, there was just so much substance to, to all the different panels that she would put together. And, and I think we need that, you know, I think we need that kind of philanthropy. We need that kind of connection. Um, we need to talk to each other. We need to meet each other. We need to understand each other. Uh, and, you know, and, and we need to blend in and realize that, you know, we're all in this together, even though, um, you know, we're not on the same boat because some come in yachts and others come in rickety boats, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, someone's swimming, but, but at the end of the day, you know, we do have to support each other. Um, and the best way to accomplish that is by getting to know each other and understanding what our contributions are, what our concerns are, what, you know, what our needs are in, in the different communities and, and bring it together with so much division right now. It hurts me so much. I've never ever seen, and I'm sure you feel the same way, so much division in this country, so much hatred, uh, of people to people hatred. Um, and, and it's very sad. And I can't wait to see how we can come out of this you know what can we all do as a nation as as citizens in this country to contribute to to a change a change of attitude so it, it, it involves a change of heart i mean my heart hurts from some of the things i've seen you know the shooting and and uvalde and, and others we it, it it takes developing compassion and i think we've lost the way in terms of looking at how we can each individually act. I mean, I love the quote from Joan Baez, uh, the antidote to uh, action is the antidote to despair. And beyond that, it's, it's really digging in, and this is why I love the virtues and, and reviving uh, that book and gonna do a renewed edition. It's all in the freeholders. 
because we need to draw from our virtues, the best selves, not the, not the lesser selves. Right. And, and I think that's one of the things that we really have to get through kind of falling away from uh, religion in, a form, in its formal way and, and, and perhaps in some of the dogma and practices. But the ideas behind each of these great uh, spiritual traditions is very important and very, uh, there's common ground there. And it's to be a better person. It's to love the creator. It's to be good and do good. And so I think we learned that in our culture at, at the time that we were growing up and that needs to be maintained and revived. And for everybody, we have to come together, like you say, and understand, try to understand each other and more than anything, love one another. That's one of the cardinal rules of every great spiritual tradition. So there, you know, we got to get the truth out there. Uh, I want to see a white paper from you at ABC. We need one. We haven't had one in decades. And uh, that's something that's very important, I think, to work towards because we do need to change hearts. And, and the way you do that is, is, is through understanding and through appreciation and through uh, uh, just digging into to, to try to reach across and understand another human being situation, walk in the moccasin. You know, wherever we can. I mean, you have this space now where you're you know, trying to reach people with, with, with different messages from, from different community, you know, members of our community. I think the media is very powerful and the media, you know, can also make that difference. Um, our politicians, if they can agree on anything, maybe could help make the difference. So I think all of us in our different spaces need to be able to take advantage of whatever forum we have, no matter what it is, to help make that change. You know, you, you mentioned the Uvalde shooting and I just came back from Uvalde and I will be going back several times. But, you know, it, it's interesting. I've learned so much about about that particular community and how strong they are. And I've been looking into their history, how in 1970, they had a walkout during the civil rights era and the Chicano movement era. And they had a walkout in their school of about almost 600 students from all levels uh, to support uh, a Mexican American professor. And they, they walked out for six weeks and they demanded change. And that just shows you that that is such a strong community that now with what happened right now, with the tragedy that happened, they're able to do that now again and demand change. But that is a community that's 80% Hispanic and, uh, you know, but they have faced so much discrimination in the past and they have been resilient and they have rose above it, rose and above that. And I'm sure that they will, you know, do that. That's not gonna necessarily ease their pain yeah. Uh, I don't think there's anything right now that is going to ease the pain that they have as a community, um, but you know, hopefully it will it will lead to some kind of change so these things don't happen again. It'll be important to really pursue uh, the restriction on uh, military assault style weapons. There should be a ban. They shouldn't be allowed on the city streets. It, it's it's horrific that we have that. Uh, there's a difference between a hunting rifle and a handgun and a military style weapon. So that's going to create some movement. I, I hope people activate because I always like to say that we're God's hands and feet. Uh, you know, it doesn't happen without us moving and doing the changing and doing taking the effort to make the changes. But uh, that has to change. That has to change. Well, what is coming up next for you? What are your next uh, beyond? You know, you're now at ABC and what other what other things are on your bucket list? Well, you know, I'm um, hoping to be able to continue collaborating with, with ABC. We have a lot of stories coming up. I'm always searching for stories to cover that will enlighten uh, this country on who we are and, and, and how much we, we offer. So I'm always searching for that. And, you know, also I'm, I'm gonna be participating um, also uh, as, a, as a consultant with a new network that was just formed, the Latino Media Network for that is creating audio for, for uh, audio content for for radio and just bought you know 18 radio stations in in Spanish and also I want to continue you know creating content for streaming and my um in in, in the deal that I have with ABC I'm, uh, I'm allowed to do that so you know I'm not gonna give up you know it's like um retirement what does retirement mean to me retirement means not having to go every single day getting up and putting my heels on and 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 I only wear makeup when I have to do interviews like yours otherwise no <laughs> But, you know, 
I'm, I, I just want to continue creating and I want to continue growing. And that circling back now, that was one of the lessons that I learned from my father. Don't be a conformist and you never stop learning and you never stop growing. So it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how much you've already accomplished. There's always something new to learn. There's always something you know, new to, to experience and something new to contribute. And uh, so I guess it's, going, it's full circle for me. I'm still... Um, following my parents' footsteps after all these years and listening to their advice and, and moving forward and, and always being open to, to new, new experiences and new challenges um, again. Well, there are many, many challenges that we're facing and I'm glad that you're gonna keep plowing on. I think we have to, I mean, a number of people that I know that are in their eighties are really, uh, that have been keeping archives for 50 years on the Chicano movement on cross-border issues and everything else and uh, uh, creating a project called Mujeres de las Americas to honor indigenous women from Canada to the tip of South America. So there are a lot of good initiatives going on that are very positive. And uh, I hope we can you know, involve you in some of those. You're already ahead of the game on all of this and you know we have to keep going. That people hear it, they don't want to be the best kept secret. We need you create those in incredible initiatives and then there's a limited amount of, of um, you know, people that see it. And, and just to end, because I know that, that, that your time is up now, it, one of the things that, that I thought in, in my thought process throughout you know, the few years that I thought about this is time for me to leave Univision is you know, we do an incredible job in Spanish language media to inform the Latino community, to empower the Latino community. But after a while, it's almost preaching to the choir. We need to get our stories out there to mainstream America. They need to see us for what we are, a vital, part of this country, an integral part of our society. And it would be hard to survive without, without us in it. That's absolutely true. And I wanna thank you for your um, amazing contributions, uh, not only to the Latina community, but to the, uh, you know, the, the greater perspective and broader perspective of, you know, of American uh, television viewers, both in Spanish and in English. And I'm grateful for your, uh, sliding over to the English language side more now. And uh, that's gonna be very powerful. I'm so thankful that you are here. I wish you well and uh, you know, keep on doing what you're doing.